Good morning, everyone. This, my name is Karim Ezran. I'm the senior fellow and director of the North Africa Initiative at the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C. I welcome all of you to this uh, discussion uh, event to, centered around the, the report at the Sadek Institute, whom I thank for having a, decided to present, to present and launch the, the, the work with us on Libya, the Great Game, a Decade of Revolution, Civil War, and Foreign Intervention. Um, uh, well, for, 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 for timing's sake, I'll pass, pass the, word, the floor now to the director of the Sadek Institute, Anna Sargomati, for the introduction and the, uh, and the presentation of the, of, the, of the report. And then we will move into welcoming our, our, our speakers, our guests, and, and begin the, the, the debate and the discussion. Anas. Thank you very much, Karim. I'd just like to thank yourself for kindly hosting us today and the Atlantic Council for also giving us this virtual space. I'm delighted, of course, it's been a decade of revolution. It's a, it's a strange time and a, an unusual time to reflect on the last decade and the events of the last decade. Um, and with that in mind, that is the reason why we chose to, to name the title The Great Game. I think it's been a difficulty for analysts, for, um, for, for, for diplomats, for, for commentators alike, in trying to look at the Arab Spring and, and trying to understand and, and give something succinct to really identify and, and, and conceptualize the last decade. And so, you know, in a, on a very personal note, when I've been reading all these, these commentaries, I'm unsure of how to really look at Libya over the last decade. Has it been a, is, is, it, is the Arab Spring being written as an obituary? Is it being written as a love letter? And I think somewhere, somewhere in between, Libya finds itself within that story. It's, you know, it's not the dreamlike scenario that Tunisia passed through a decade ago. It's not, you know, and unlike Tunisia, that, that kind of with its difficulties blossomed into a democracy quite, quite quickly, it's not been the same. But on the other hand, with Egypt, where, you know, the, the, the revolution was, was almost stolen by the military after a coup in 2013, you know, it wasn't the same as Egypt. And in, and in Syria, regretfully, the tragedy that has unfolded over the past decade of civil war there, Libya is neither of those stories or it's, it's, it's a part of all of them in some way. In some respects, there was a peaceful transfer of power in 2011. There were democratic elections. There have also been two civil wars in 2019 and 2014. And in between those moments, there have also been several coups. And in that respect, when one looks at the timeline over the last decade, it's difficult to imagine how Libya got to this place where it's at. I'm often asked questions like, you know, do you regret what happened in 2011? Would you go back and would you change things? And I always find those those questions kind of unusual as if, you know, the agency was entirely the Libyans. I think in 2011, there was a premature assumption that Libyans themselves could be the custodian to take Libya from this dystopian authoritarian regime into a new utopia and a democracy. And so Libya's revolution, not only did it not take place in the context or a closed context or a vacuum, it took place within a new emerging regional order. And I think that's really where the story starts. You know, one has to look back at the last decade and ask ourselves, you know, where where were the moments that really changed this this uh, this country's course? I mean, given that there were democratic elections in 2011, did it seem like this was never going to transpire into something that was fruitful, that something that was at least going to look like it was stable? And I think the intervention on the part of other international players, beginning with NATO's operation uh, Operation Unified Protector, and then in the latter part of 2014 and 2019 with the interventions of Gulf actors and Gulf states, of other regional powers, of superpowers, Libya has become this unusual great game in the way that Afghanistan and Central Asia became in the latter part of the 18th and 19th century, became you know, a, a scramble for influence by great powers. Libya today has the same, has become that kind of theater. It's drawn in all of these different powers from European actors to regional actors and Gulf states to other international powers or declining powers like Russia. And I think that's one of the reasons why over the last decade, we can't tell this Libyan story without understanding the soundtrack, really the, the, the ability for other actors to not only shape the events on the ground, but also to falter Libya's, uh, 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 falter Libya's transition, its democratic transition. So I think that's really the kind of the inspiration behind why we launched this report. And I've been delighted with the reports that have come back so far, we have 12, reports from 12, uh, 13 different authors um, uh, on the US, the UK, Russia, Italy, France, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Qatar, the UAE, and Russia. Um, and uh, I hope I haven't forgotten any of the, uh, any of the, the, the countries there, but I think 
in the next 24 hours when we publish this report, I'm looking forward to the, not this being the end of that conversation, but really it being the long-term conversation about the way that the international community is, has, has shaped Libya, but also continues to shape Libya in the aftermath of the of the uh, the latest UN um, uh, unification process, the Berlin process that will unify the country politically, militarily, and economically, and should lead the uh, should lead the country to democratic elections on the twenty fourth of December, twenty twenty one. There's so much left in this, and there's so much more to be said. So I'll leave my comments there, and I'll and I'll pass the floor back to to Karim and let him uh, introduce the uh, the rest of the distinguished guests. Thank you. Thanks to you, Anas. I really think that we have three great scholars with us today to, 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 to discuss exactly this point, the, the great game, the, the outsider power, the outsider influence, how they interacted or intervened or contrasted what was happening inside Libya and determined it to a certain extent, to a certain extent, not entirely, but to a certain extent, all the, all the event in the last few, few years. We have with us Ambassador Deborah Jones, who retired from the US Department of State in 2016, with the rank of career minister, following 34 years of service that included twice serving as chief of mission in Kuwait, 2008-2011, and, and in Libya, 2013-2015. She, she has appeared on international news programs, uh, CNN, BBC, many times. She recently joined the Middle East Institute of Turkey Advisory Board. Next, we have uh, Roberto Menotti, who is editor in chief of Aspenia Online, and deputy editor of Aspenia and senior advisor in international activity at Aspen Institute of Italy in Rome. He's an adjunct professor in the political science department of the Università Nazionale di Roma since 2019. He published extensively and, 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 and is the author of four books in, in, in Italian. He has taught undergraduate courses at Lewis University, John Cabot University, La Sapienza, Rome, Uni, Rome, Uni, Rome, Uni, Rome, Uni, Rome University. He is, he is frequently on the, on the, Italian, on the, on the, the Italian international media and TV. Then we, we, we have an, an, an honor to have Stephen Cook, who is the ANI Enrico Mattei Senior Fellow for Middle East and African Studies, the Director of the International Affairs Fellowship for Tenure and International Relations Scholar at the Council on Foreign Relations. He's an expert on Arab and Turkish politics, as well as US Middle East politics. He's the author of False Dawn, Protest to democracy and violence in the new Middle East and the struggle for Egypt from Nasser to Tahrir Square, which won the 2012 gold medal from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And, and uh, there is a, a book I didn't know that is coming in, 2000, in 2022 The End of Ambition America's Past, Present, and Future in the Middle East, which I'm really looking, looking forward to read. I think we should start with uh, Deborah. I would like to ask you, in your opinion, what major issues would you like US foreign policy to tackle and become more present in when it comes to the MENA region? Do you expect anything on Libya from the Biden administration? Yeah, yeah. Let, me, let me answer that. First of all, let me, um, two things. Let me give a shout out to uh, Stephanie Williams, who I think has done an extraordinary yeah. Yeah. Uh, job in tying up a process that has been going on for a long time. I would agree with with everything that uh, Anna said, um, but I would, but I would, I often stress to people that part of the challenge in Libya was that there was an unfinished revolution, and I think we're all familiar with the saying that people have to be either <clears throat> exhausted enough, impoverished enough, or hurt enough by fighting to actually be willing to come to the table. And I think we finally, ironically, with uh, with the uh, Heftar's uh, assault on Tripoli. Uh, just at a time when when uh, Hassan Salome had had gotten the process to a point of everyone coming together, I think in some way that broke the dam and actually uh, created a situation where we could have uh, a conversation and where military leaders would come in. But I'm going to offer a couple of thoughts on what I think the Biden administration, what I, I can say what I'd like to see them do, but here's what I think the reality is of the current situation. I think it's pretty clear from everything we've seen thus far coming out of the administration or out of their spokesman, that US foreign policy is going to be uh, focused at stratospheric levels on rebuilding alliances and institutions to deal with global issues like pandemic, um, economic uh, stability, security, uh, security that seen through a non-military prism uh, and um, for the environment. Um, uh, to the extent that there is any intersection with these issues, which there is in Libya, you will see a focus on Libya. But I think that their goal is going to be less through the 
classic uh, military security prism and more in, in this manner of rebuilding alliances and leveraging those relationships to um, address issues and, and uh, concerns much the same way that uh, I, and I think we'll see this, and, and I think in part because NATO is so involved in Libya and is fracturing in Libya because of the different actions of the different players there. Um, I think the other thing is that we're going to see that um, policy is going to be less personalized. It will be predictive, it, predictable more. It will be deliberative and consensual. Um, it will be, uh, again, uh, consistent and collaborative. We're not going to see the kinds of surprises that rotated or revolved around the personal views of one person the same way we had the, the Heftar surprise, as I call it, when of, of Donald Trump reaching out to Halifa Heftar. Um, I think one of my colleagues used to say, well, at least with Trump, you knew what he was thinking. And I said, yes, but the problem is, is if you read John Bolton's book, which all of our friends and our enemies should read, uh, you understand that that thinking lasted for about five to 10 minutes at, at any given moment or a day, perhaps. And the problem is that you couldn't make any plans based on that. So I think that we'll have less confusion, more consistency, and again, more alliances. And that's not only going to be uh, NATO and those classic alliances, it's going to be a focus on leveraging regional alliances and regional relationships in the region. I also think that uh, their approach in the region is very much going to be on a kind of a, I don't want to call it a trickle down, but you know, people used to give the Obama administration grief for saying we lead from behind. Now, for those of us who grew up in areas where we have sheep farming, etc., we understood very well what that meant. You, you don't uh, go ahead and expect that the sheep will follow. You stay behind them and you have dogs yapping on both sides. And in the case of Libya, I think the metaphor was intended to mean the UN leads and the US helps by keeping other people in line and making sure we have a consensus. I think this time we're going to see something, and I, I don't want to call it killing uh, two birds with one stone, but I think the focus is going to be on big issues like Iran that have implications for larger regional areas in those conflicts in various states that if you address the situation in Iran, that's going to address some of the other issues as well. I think it's going to be a focus on clearly on Yemen, on a conflict there that is causing division and strife throughout the GCC and in other countries in the region and also contributing to impoverishment and some of these other uh, crises um, that tie into the first point I made about their focus. But I also think that there is going to be a very, I suspect um, that there will be a very robust, albeit delicate and careful uh, diplomacy with Turkey because of Turkey's importance uh, geopolitically, which in which we still share, despite all of the problems, despite the, you know, the, the, the nadir in our relationship right now, which some have uh, asserted is worse than the crisis with uh, Cyprus in 1974. But nonetheless, the US and Turkey share many, many interests and goals and objectives. And I think uh, in Libya, uh, Turkey's role there and elsewhere in the Eastern Mediterranean, what's happening there where uh, NATO is being fragmented from within by competition with between its members. I think we're going to see a lot more focus on a very uh, robust, as I say, diplomacy to try to realign our interests with Turkey's and to try to, in doing so, allow, make space for the U.S. to play a role in, in mediation, perhaps in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, in Libya, in other places. I don't think we're going to see the same kind of U.S. intervention. I don't think, you know, at one time I had actually counseled certain Libyan leaders that, you know, if you were to open a base up again in Libya to the Americans, they, they'd happily go there. I'm not sure we're there anymore. Uh, I think we will continue to play a role on counterterrorism. I think that we will continue to look for alliances across the board on that. I hope and believe that we will play a more assertive role in um, preventing um, destabilizing actions in Libya by external players, whether it's arms shipments, whether it's support for groups like Wagner or for external uh, groups and, and, the, and uh, you know, who are brought in to engage in proxy warfare. Proxy warfare is kind of a curious term here because in fact, uh, what we have are two other groups and it, particularly in the case of Russia, I think uh, looking very eagerly to establish a toehold 
um, in, their, in, in Libya that gives them that access to the soft underbelly, as we've always said, of, of, of Europe and of NATO and of our alliance there. Now, having said all that, I will offer one other kind of a, a viewpoint that I think a lot of people are not going to particularly enjoy. I, I think the reality is that in this modern age and with all the com competition in the world and the competition, uh, the different levers of power that whether they're cyber, whether they're you know, economic, whatever that people are playing, um, the U.S. is no longer in a position, either militarily or politically, to unilaterally dis deliver decisive fiats in any of the conflicts around the world. Um, we can be supportive, we can be influential, but we're, we are going to have to accept that the world is got to focus with so many small nation states and states incapable, really, of governing themselves in the same, in, in a classic Weberian definition of sovereignty, um, that we're going to have to look, and states are going to have to look to regional arrangements again. And I often think of, uh, of Italy at, at a previous period, um, but I, I think there will still be centers of power, but I think the way that we shape those powers, it's not going to be a superpower or a hyperpower like the United States saying, let there be light and there's light. It's going to be the US and other alliance members and others working patiently together to try to bring about um, solutions, transparency, um, to uh, to put a halt, um, you know, to make clear that it, uh, that uh, intervention, these interventions are non-productive and and destabilize the situation for everyone. But that would be my my uh, larger point on U.S. policy. Thanks. Very interesting. So 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 you see alliances ad hoc being formed in various theaters. And various actions be instead of guided or directed by by, by uh, the superpowers and by their logic. You see each superpower gathering around around it itself uh, on, on various theater. In this case, Libya, a group of other states to form a coalition, a hoc coalition to pursue certain certain projects, certain certain uh, aims. I think that that's just the reality because I think that. Um, Turkey is going to continue to reassert itself for domestic reasons as well as uh, its geopolitical security and other reasons. Um, Russia is, you know, got its own motivations for reasserting itself. It realizes that it's not a hyperpower. It's not, you know, the U.S. focus is going to be on China in terms of competition and cooperation. Um, but uh, I think that it's unavoidable. I'm not saying it's necessarily this is what anyone desires. I think it's the reality of the current situation that we're going to have to work very carefully with people um, to negotiate agreements that uh, recognize the realities of, of where we are. And, and, there, and, and in that mix, you're going to see a lot of apparently contradictory relationships. I mean, Turkey and Russia uh, take, for example, uh, are competitors in, in many areas, and they have shared interests in many areas. And I mean, the single uh, biggest uh, factor from the US side and the US-Turkish relationship, which has implications for NATO on a huge scale, is of course the S-400 uh, uh, situation, which, uh, which again, um, you know, the Turks would say that can be resolved technically, and that I don't want to get into the weeds on that. But uh, and the U.S. says, no, this is a policy decision that is very damaging to NATO. And yet you have the Turks competing with the Russians in Libya, in Syria, you know, in, in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, you know, and, and these other places. Yeah. Uh, but I have a feeling that unless the Libyan government really pulls itself together, um, the, the Libyan people in this new government, they really need to come together the way the five plus five military leaders and others did. And, and really support the formation of not only the election of a new government. I've often said to people, and I think they get tired of hearing it, but having elections without having a, an institution behind them or a constitution or a clear uh, division of authorities and, and um, powers is like replacing the, the nib on the tip of your fountain pen without having ink in it or without having the structure of the pen. I mean, Libyans do elections very well. We've seen that several times. The problem is the governance that has to come afterwards. And so I do believe that the more Libyans demonstrate that they can cohere and that they can actually uh, create a foundation for cooperation, they will receive that cooperation and there will be a greater argument to be made against foreign intervention, especially for oil production, energy production, everything else. 
You know how difficult it is to, to talk about constitution today in Libya. I know. <laughs> the the risk of being misunderstood is... is, is uh, yeah. I, I, I'm still one of those things that you can have an election without a constitution, as long as the parliament that gets elected is a constituent assembly. Correct. Right. But yeah. here's the problem with that again. And from the time I arrived in 2013 in Libya, uh, it was clear that uh, that the GNC that had been elected was already was still engaged in a competition, a revolutionary competition almost, uh, that was oh. not allowing for any coherent policies. And this created an opening space of whores a vacuum, you know, but Tarek Mitri, bless his heart, he was already having to negotiate with the different bodies within the parliament because it was so fractured. Um, yeah, as opposed yeah. to being a, a, a unitary uh, a body that could support the prime minister. True, absolutely true. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Deborah. Yeah. All right, and now to pass to Roberto Menotti. And, and uh, De 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 Deborah has, has, has depicted a, a situation where a very fluid system of, of, of ad hoc alliances, which will we do, we'll probably, we'll probably put a strain on those formal fixed alliances like, the, like, like, like NATO and other, and other organizations. I'd like you, Roberto, to talk about the, the European predicament towards Libya, which in a sense, in a sense is now is an acute microcosm of the problems we are facing on the southern, on the, on the southern shore. The inconsistency of the European position seems to me to be partly connected to Obama's description of the matter when he said the Europeans asked us to implement an air operation, but then they did not take care of the country after the fall of, of the dictator. Can we really say that he was incorrect? Roberto. Thank you very much for the invitation, for the opportunity and, and for the question, of course. Uh, well, uh, I think I was actually re-reading uh, a couple of days ago Obama's uh, memoirs, well, the part of his memoirs that have already been published, being half of the work, presumably. And of course, memoirs are what they are, so they uh, are, of course, they reflect the point of view of the author, in his case, from a President Obama. But I think, yes, it is an important starting point to remember how uh, the intervention developed, because that, to me, uh, reflects and captures pretty well uh, the, as you called it, the predicament of the Europeans as a whole, which I see also in other parts of the Mediterranean basin and the wider Middle East, not just in Libya, Libya being a, a crucial case in point, but certainly not the only one. Uh, I, I would start with uh, one uh, general uh, assumption, uh, which is actually a statement of fact, I think. Uh, it is important to always remember why Libya is important uh, in a wider scheme of things. Uh, and it is important for a number of reasons. Uh, one, I think, of course, is energy resources. We all know about that, especially as Italians. Any, of course, is very aware of that, but many others are uh, uh, aware of this. Uh, but also its geographical location. I mean, the position of Libya is, is objectively quite significant for anybody interested in the Mediterranean. Uh, simply the, the place where it sits as, as a pretty large country, by the way. Um, uh, the, you know, the trade routes that, uh, um, let's say, we can see around uh, Libya's territory. Of course, the migration flows, uh, again, as Europeans, we're extremely aware of that as a transit country, mostly, uh, but as clearly a door, a pathway uh, to Europe from uh, the rest of Africa. Um, and then, of course, with, with the, all the developments uh, in uh, East Med uh, affair, there's also more to that. There's also a problem with uh, territorial waters, uh, exploitation rights, and so on. So in a way, Libya has become more important since 2011 in many ways. Uh, and that's, I would say, a statement of fact that can help us understand why so many countries are so deeply interested in what happens in Libya, more so than, I would say, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, now, let me get to the European problem, what I would really agree we should call the European predicament. I mean, there's a fundamental incoherence in the way that the Europeans have been dealing with Libya. Again, uh, not unlike what we've been doing with, with several other countries on the southern shore of the Mediterranean. We usually tend to identify uh, the shared interests uh, quite late, usually only when some acute crisis strikes. That's the time when we realize we have shared common interests. Otherwise, it tends to be pretty much declaratory policy, but not really a common sense of engagement and involvement in the common policy we theoretically agree upon at the European level. Uh, then we move pretty late to develop a plan. 
uh, if we do at all. Uh, we usually, on a national level, just as we all uh, remember, that's exactly what happened in 2011, not even the EU asking for some kind of American support, but essentially uh, individual countries, mostly in that specific case, uh, uh, through an initiative by uh, France and the UK in the context of the UN Security Council. Um, we then, after, in, in the case of Libya, after the intervention takes place, and that's the Obama, uh, that's Obama's uh, argument, if you wish, we quickly forget about the shared interest and we revert to a purely national view of whatever is left of that crisis after the intervention. And I'm, I'm re sort of uh, uh, tracing this development because it happens pretty often. I've seen something similar with Syria, for instance. I've seen something similar uh, back uh, with the with the Iraqi uh, invasion, whether you agreed with it or not. But on many other issues, uh, uh, I see that there's a kind of, of European syndrome when it comes to foreign and security policy. Not exactly the same, of course, history never exactly repeats itself, but we tend to uh, repeat a similar uh, uh, process, so to say. And we constantly forget that the only way that the Europeans, or if you wish the EU collectively, uh, even within the NATO context, so not necessarily the EU, but the Europeans in connection with our transatlantic uh, relationship can actually exert any influence on any external issue is to combine all of our resources, which means diplomatic influence, of course, economic influence, whatever we can get, uh, humanitarian aid, depending on the crisis at hand, and of course, military power as well. The problem is we tend to, and that's exactly what we did in, in the case of Libya, we tend to use these uh, um, uh, elements of influence in sequence, or I would say sporadically, never in combination, which means that we tend to get much less that, than we could, even once we decide to actually have a common, uh, uh, that we have a common plan. Now, of course, in this general context, uh, the Trump administration, the four years of Trump administration has been uh, uh, a huge distraction in a way, because it, it has complicated the transatlantic relationship per se, uh, regardless of, you know, um, issues and, and, and crises or questions that we could have faced together. And, and of course, we've simply been discussing about, you know, NATO uh, commitments uh, as if they're you know, they come out of the blue and they're completely unrelated to whatever NATO should be doing. Uh, and, and so basically I see the past four years as a huge uh, distraction. There's been um, a very bad relationship with Germany, especially. And of course, there's been meddling with the Brexit affair, which clearly has been a disaster for the Europeans, uh, even just uh, as, as a, uh, you know, as a, as a general phenomenon as an experience, as a political experience, and Trump just complicated that very much. Um, so um, that gets us to where we are now. Let, let's get to the, the present situation the way I uh, see it in, in, in bits and pieces. Um, of course, the EU also has, and I would say the Europeans in general, uh, have a fundamental problem in the case of Libya, uh, at least because of the role uh, that two uh, countries have been playing. And uh, uh, one is Italy, uh, the other quite, quite predictably is France. I mean, let's face it. Um, uh, France, of course, has had its own way of dealing with Libya uh, to probably get more directly uh, involved in, in its domestic affairs for reasons that are by the way, perfectly legitimate to some extent. I mean, be it energy interest, commercial interest, geopolitical interest, that's okay. Problem is, uh, there's been absolutely no way to uh, make any European position stick uh, as long as France goes its way and Italy goes its separate way. Italy, by the way, being an Italian, I'll just take uh, three minutes on, on the Italian position, which I personally find uh, very difficult to understand because it's been, again, very incoherent itself. Uh, I mean, Italy essentially, and just summarizing very quickly, Italy decided to intervene to contribute to the 2011 intervention very reluctantly. Uh, last to say the least. And very reluctantly, exactly, because I'm being polite, uh, being very formal here. Uh, then we realized, and that's again Obama's point, if you wish, uh, that there would be an aftermath to the end of the regime that we had links with, 
that we had ties with that was somewhat advantageous to us for a number of reasons, not just to us, to the Europeans as well. Just think of the migration flows, of course, and not just that. Uh, and just when there was space for, you know, some kind of influence on the part of Italy and possibly the Europeans uh, collectively, uh, we almost com completely forgot about Libya. And Karine is very aware of this process. I mean, we basically thought it was a secondary issue, that it was too complicated. Uh, we decided, yes, to support uh, the government in Tripoli, of course, um, formally, officially recognized by the international community, as we like to say, but we never really supported it 100%. And at some point, I would say 2019, approximately, I think the, the Italian uh, establishment, foreign policy establishment, actually began to have second thoughts, even about that. Absolutely. Support, right. And we started thinking, well, maybe that's not even the right choice. That's it's the historical tradition of changing the flag in the middle of this. Exactly, exactly. And, and the question is whether we change it, you know, uh, uh, an odd or an even number of times. But, you know, I mean, I'm exaggerating a bit, but it was really incoherent in the sense that having, you know, knowing that we do have an interest historically, geographically, for the reasons I quickly recall, and of course, because of our energy interest, it's a little bit of a mystery why we haven't tried to exercise a somewhat more coherent and, and uh, you know, stable role. Of course, again, uh, having acknowledged that uh, France has been a big uh, headache, no doubt, for Italy and for Europe uh, as, a, as a whole. Um, now, uh, let me get very quickly uh, to the end of what I wanted to say. Uh, a quick word on Turkey and Russia, again, as seen from essentially a, a European perspective. Uh, it seems to me that Turkey's involvement is, ex is especially interesting and to some extent worrisome, but also interesting analytically, because I believe it's probably the only real partial success, partial success of their neo-Ottoman strategy. I mean, all the rest, frankly, has been a disaster. Uh, one partial success they can claim to have achieved is their role in Libya, uh, which at some point uh, intersected uh, Ital Italy's uh, interest, but by chance, I mean, by accident, I would say, not by coordination. Um, and, and I believe that Turkey is looking at the entire uh, North Africa uh, scenario, not just Libya. It has a somewhat wider perspective than just Libya when it, it thinks of Libya. Uh, Russia, uh, same thing, and something has been said already, I perfectly agree uh, with my distinguished predecessor. Uh, yes, absolutely, Russia has, uh, again, a wider perspective on the region. I think Russia is also thinking in terms of Africa as a whole, Africa, the continent, not just North Africa through Libya. Uh, so not just Mediterranean basin and, you know, the bases, the, uh, the, the sea basin itself, but also beyond Libya looking south. Um, uh, of course, there's Egypt as well, uh, the Gulf countries, they're all very interested, involved and influential. So it seems to me that the paradox is that we, we moved from a situation where before 2011, Libya was very much under the influence of Western countries one way or another. Of course, it had its own relationships, uh, broadly speaking, with others, but it was actually largely affected by the Europeans and the United States. And now it's as if we're almost completely excluded from developments on the ground, which is really a, uh, an interesting uh, uh, twist of fate uh, in, in the space of not even 10 years, but probably three, four, five, five years. Now, what could change? And that's really the end of my uh, remarks. Well, if we try to look at the bright side, what could happen, uh, at least uh, theoretically, is that, uh, I mean, uh, we might argue perhaps that Russia and Turkey have actually achieved some of their key objectives in Libya at this point. So maybe they could be content with what they have achieved. Russia has a foothold. Uh, Turkey has, you know, sort of contained the influence of countries and forces it considers hostile to its own interest. So there's a chance that, yes, they could be uh, uh, willing and able to contribute to some mediation effort, even in a UN context, perhaps. At the same time, of course, we have a Biden re-engagement, although I very much agree again uh, with Deborah Jones with all the limitations that we should probably realistically expect uh, from, um, from Washington's perspective. Uh, another possibly bright side, but Karim, of course, and, and all of you know much more than I do about this, uh, maybe, maybe uh, there's a new generation of Libyan leaders 
that could actually change the begin to change the picture. Uh, and that's very important because a little bit of uh, uh, Libyan ownership, of course, in a peace process would be absolutely crucial. We shouldn't forget that it should be a Libyan process with any kind of international support, multilateral support, hopefully UN support, hopefully, but ultimately there needs to be a Libyan configuration that makes it you know, possible. And my very last point, um, the, the Gulf countries. I mean, in, in several ways, they've been playing a role that let's say has not been very helpful to a stabilization process. Again, uh, perhaps uh, there's a Biden effect we can anticipate there. Um, we shouldn't exaggerate, again, the, the impact of that. But I think some of these countries, perhaps including Egypt, perhaps including Turkey itself, uh, but again, especially the, the, the Gulf countries, uh, could uh, uh, think of Libya in terms of a window of opportunity to re-adjust uh, their position, not just vis-a-vis -vis the United States, but vis-a-vis -vis regional affairs in general, becoming somewhat more cautious, perhaps, becoming slightly more willing to cooperate with others and coordinate with, with others. I'm not so sure, but I think there are some uh, um, signs that we could actually think of this as, as a glass half empty, so to say. And I'll stop here. And uh, again, thanks for the, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, th th thank you very much, Roberto. Very interesting. And the fact that uh, the, the, the Libya can, 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 can produce a new generation of, of better leaders has been at the center of our prayers for a long time. We keep on praying intensely. Uh, I like I like I like to exploit some of the presence of Stephen Cook, whose passion for Turkey has led him to write a great deal on the subject. I would like to see how does he see the since, since 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 Roberto spoke, spoke, spoke a lot about Turkey and Russia. I like I like I, I like Stephen. If you can can talk about the role of Turkey, how 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 you see it today, not only in Libya but in the whole the, the, the whole area, and maybe maybe elsewhere. In which direction do you do? Do you think it, it 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 will most probably take? Well, first of all, uh, thank you so much, Kareem, for the very kind invitation to take part in this meeting. Um, it's it's great uh, on a number of levels. Um, just broadly speaking, uh, when I first came to Washington many years ago, I kept saying to people, you know, I really think North Africa is very, very important. And they would say, go sit in the corner, young man. Um, Arab-Israeli conflict is where it's at. And I said, you know, I actually think North Africa is really important. And actually, North Africa is very, very important. Two, I appreciate the invitation from you because you are my Libya Yoda. Uh, I've learned so much about Libya. And in my, my last book, uh, I did write about Libya, but I as you can attest everybody, every time I wrote a paragraph, I would send it to you and say, is this right? Is this right? Did I interpret what you wrote? You are too nice. Um, so I, I very much appreciate that. And then also because Libya, you know, if you're someone my age and got involved in, you know, studying uh, political science and international relations and was interested in the Middle East, Libya was a, a no-go zone for many, many, many years. And um, it's endlessly fascinating. Uh, I feel a, a bit uh, of an ab outsider being an Egypt and, and Turkey obsessive, but of course, Egypt and Turkey are fully engaged in Libya. So uh, it is a very, very important topic. Let me start though with the broader, uh, I'll start with a, a little bit about US and Turkey, uh, get a little more narrow on Turkey and the Middle East and then get even narrower on, on, on Libya. And, um, you know, I, 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 hate to, I hate to be, you know, contrarian, um, but I, I, I think that um, Deborah and I are going to have to agree to disagree when it comes to the U.S.-Turkey relationship, and it's bearing on the Middle East. I see these countries not as, as two allies who are searching for ways to come back to each other, but as two countries that are really moving in different directions, um, that no longer share interests. There's not a big project that the two of them share. They have different goals. They clearly have different values, um, and that we are left with a situation where we have to, uh, at times, um, we there are going to be places where we'll be able to work with Turkey. There are going to be places where we will have to get out of each other's ways and places where we're going to have to oppose uh, what Turkey is doing. I think this is a kind of natural evolution of both American foreign policy and Turkish uh, foreign policy. Turkey wants to be an independent actor, independent of the United States and independent of NATO. Um, it has said so any number of times, 
and Turkish decision makers and policymakers uh, bristle at the idea that Turkey can uh, once again be a quote unquote asset to the United States. In fact, when the first components of the S-400 were delivered to an air base outside of Ankara, uh, the Turkish foreign minister declared it Independence Day. Um, so uh, it's not just about a technical issue over the S-400, it's that Turkey and the United States uh, view the world increasingly in, in different shades of gray and are pursuing their interests in, in, in different ways. I can go through the long list of issues that separate the two countries. I don't think it's really necessary. We know all of them besides uh, the S-400. We know YPG, we know Fethullah Gulen, we know on and on and on and on and on. Um, but um, it, it's important to recognize also that the United States is developing relations in the region that and a warming of relations with Greece and the continuation, interestingly, of an American led order in the region that is, uh, from the Turkish perspective, not necessarily advantageous to Ankara's, uh, to Ankara's power. I, it is true that Turkey and Russia are on uh, opposite ends of a variety of conflicts in the region, including Libya, um, but they continue to develop their ties. And the question is, given their differences in Libya, given their differences in Nagorno-Karabakh, given their differences in Syria, the question that you have to ask is why? And the why really has to do with the fact that neither Russia nor Turkey believe in this American-led order in the region that is, that is beneficial, uh, that is beneficial uh, to them. And that leads me ultimately to the question about Turkey in the Middle East and uh, what it is doing there and what its goals are. And I think you can see a lot of the goals that Turkey has in the Middle East in its intervention, uh, in, its intervention uh, in Libya. Um, let me point out though that, you know, this has not been advantageous to Libya's strategic position, in, uh, to Turkey's strategic position in the region, which began to collapse in 2013 and has continued. Um, that is to say that Turkey has very difficult relation with all of the important states of the region. Now, <laughs> the, those are not uh, fine upstanding necessarily, necessarily fine upstanding international citizens to say the least, but it suggests that Turkey has uh, a, a, different, a different view. And part of that is, and it plugs right into its intervention in Libya, is that the Turks have, the Justice and Development Party has uh, President Erdogan has, and the, I think the, the base of support for, for the Justice and Development Party in Turkey, and outside the basis of support for the Justice and Development Party in Turkey, believes very strongly in the idea that Turkey is pursuing a foreign policy that is based on principles and values. Um, that is why it opposed the coup d'etat in Egypt in 2013. That is why it has supported the Palestinians. And that is why it intervened, uh, in part, why it intervened in Libya to support the government of national accord, which was the internationally recognized government. And the responsible thing, at least this is what Turkish uh, leaders have said to their population, the responsible thing to do it is to support it, especially in light of military operations launched uh, against this government by a would-be strongman, former Qaddafist Khalifa Heftar, who happens to be supported by two of, but not only by two of uh, Turkey's uh, adversaries in the region, in the region, Egypt and the United Arab Emirates. It's part of a broader effort and something that the Justice and Development Party has tried to, how it has tried to frame its foreign policy over many years is that Turkey stands apart from other regional actors in upholding international norms and standards. Um, and in places that is actually true, it's also self-serving politically for President Erdogan and the Justice and Development Party because it does play very, very well in, in, in Turkey. I think the second reason, and again, this plugs right into Turkey's goals and rationales and motivations in the region, is that its intervention in Libya is part of a broader set of counter moves to the tightening of ties among Turkey's regional adversaries, notably Egypt, Greece, Cyprus, and Turkey, and then add the UAE uh, into it. Um, it was, uh, I think, extraordinary this summer that uh, the Emiratis were taking part in air exercises, uh, bilateral air exercises with the Hellenic Air Force over Crete. Uh, it's kind of a far from the UAE. Um, but um, it, it, at the core, Egypt, Greece, Cyprus, and Turkey in its Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum is um, 
of course, it is a, a commercial forum dedicated to exploiting and marketing natural resources found in the Eastern Mediterranean, but it's really that hiding as uh, a nascent um, kind of security uh, group. Uh, all of those countries coincidentally have uh, not good relations uh, with Turkey. And I, I think if you're a strategic planner sitting in Ankara, you have to uh, take a look at what's happening uh, in uh, among Egypt, Greece, Cyprus, and Turkey and say, hey, um, our neighbors are trying to choke us off from our front yard and we need to do something about it. And that is, again, in part why uh, the intervention in, uh, in Libya. Uh, then I mentioned before, there is a broader game that Turkey is involved in uh, with its primary regional adversaries, um, Egypt and uh, the UAE. Um, Egypt and the UAE, which have been supportive of, as I mentioned before, Khalifa Heftar. Um, and uh, this is part of a, a great game within a great game. And uh, I, I think that there has been a, a goal uh, to counter the exercise, particularly of Emirati power, um, a, against the backdrop of the war of words between, uh, between Turkey uh, and Egypt. Uh, my own sense is uh, on this, um, the Emiratis have really lost interest in a variety of ways. Um, Heftar has proven to be kind of a loser um, and uh, unable to do much. I mean, he lost in Chad, he's losing here. I, I think they're not that interested in, in putting any more money on that and will eventually see some sort of kind of stepping away from this conflict. I think the Egyptians um, are, are, are still in, in this game but have changed tactics. I think that they were, everybody this summer said, oh, the Egyptians, when they said they had a red line, that they were bluffing. Um, but I do think it gave pause to, uh, to the Turks. Um, uh, I think the Turks have demonstrated in a variety of areas that they are technically proficient in uh, their military operations. But let's not forget the fact that they are far away from home. And the Egyptians really do have the ability to bring a lot of kind of heavyweight force to bear. Um, but the Egyptians having now, you know, kind of helped with that pause are now changing tactics and see, seeming to wanting to outmaneuver Turkey in, uh, in, in Tripoli. And then, you know, the, the other, I think, thing that's motivating Turkey and Libya in the region is this thing that Turkey is pursuing called Blue Homeland, uh, which is uh, alleged to be a strategy uh, cooked up by uh, retired naval officers that Erdogan, President Erdogan has, has embraced, hasn't embraced, will embrace, sort of is embraced. Um, uh, but it's not much of a strategy because it's really based on, you know, kind of revanchism, romance, and profound antipathy for Turkey's regional allies. It's uh, traditional allies. It's really unclear how it enhances Turkish power. Um, so, and, and that also is kind of fused with all of these uh, rationales for both Libya and the region more broadly. And then, of course, in Libya, there's the, the, the enticement of reconstruction con contracts. I mean, you know, the Turks have demonstrated that they can build a lot of things uh, 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 well uh, and on a large scale. I mean, just, you know, drop in on Erbil uh, and it uh, kind of looks and feels uh, like a, a satellite of, of Turkey, which in some ways it is. Um, you know, so, so that's kind of the rationale for that is the rationale for Libya and again, broadly the Middle East. I think that um, uh, Roberto said something that I think was very interesting. The Turks have been partially successful in Libya. They have certainly um, played, I think, a, a, an important role. One that I think was unexpected um, in stabilizing the situation and setting the stage for the successful negotiations that have, uh, that have proceeded. Um, and I think that that's, uh, I, I think that's a testament to um, the Turks' uh, diplomatic efforts there, but also their military efforts. I mean, they, they have demonstrated a significant military proficiency and creativity, uh, along with a large uh, contingent of Syrian mercenaries to reverse uh, the dire straits that the government of national accord was in to set the stage for a more uh, for uh, negotiations. But the question is, and this is the partial point, I'm not sure if Roberto was getting at the similar kind of thing that I'm getting at here is that, you know, now the Turks are in deep, they're in Libya fairly deep. And the question is, I'm not sure, even with these negotiations that are going on, there's by no means 
should we, you know, place any kind of, uh, you know, to be colloquial about it, money on the idea that this will come to a successful conclusion. Uh, there can, you know, what has struck me in looking at Libya over the course of the last 10 years is that you have a political process that's at this level, and then you have what's going on on the ground that's at this level, and rarely do those two things meet. The Turkish military intervention promises maybe to put those things together, at least it seems to have, but again, things can go in a, in a very different direction. So what makes Turkish officials believe they can discipline the Libyan political arena in a way that's advantageous to Turkey? This isn't despite the way in which they have presented it, always everywhere altruistic. They need clients in Tripoli. And can they discipline the Libyan political arena in a way that is advantageous to them? I think um, that is an open question. I think Libyans have the ability to calculate their own interests and pursue their own politics on their own. They do have agency. Um, so I, I think that it's, uh, it, it's a difficult thing. And, and do should they be more successful? Do they really want Libya as a client uh, in the region? That strikes me as a, as a, 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 considerable, uh, a considerable headache. And are they sure that they can outmaneuver the Egyptians in, in Libya? Now, you know, e Egypt has this kind of uh, reputation of being kind of big, dumb power and so on and so forth. It, but it, Libya also happens to be Egypt's neighbor. And it has resources, and Egypt has resources at its disposal, and does have the ability to uh, engage with various different groups uh, in in Libya. So you know there are a variety of risks for Turkey in Libya, just as there are a variety of risks for Turkey throughout the Middle East, and why they have been, despite a kind of uh, again this kind of narrative about them being altruistic and being a, a regional leader why they continue to actually have very bad relations with most of the important countries uh, in the region. They're now engaged in an effort to try to peel those countries away from each other and so on and so forth. But so far, there really haven't been any takers. Uh, so I think that, um, again, Libya is sort of this kind of metaphor for Turkish motivations. It's partial tentative successes in, in places, but also tremendous risk uh, for Turkey. I'll stop there. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, Anas, do, do, do you have any comment? Do you have anything to say before we, before we start uh, looking at the Q&A and the various questions? Thanks, Karim. Yes. I mean, uh, first and foremost, thank you to Deborah, Roberto, and to Stephen as well for, for really excellent presentations. There was so much richness. Um, and listening to all of these uh, presentations, I've you know, it, it brings me to this kind of bear of where and why Libya matters in such a way over the past decade. I think one of the things that we're missing from this conversation, and I think one of the things that I'd like to add is that the, you know, the, the Libya's political direction, its ideological tone, and ultimately its political character are still up for grabs. I don't think anybody would have imagined a decade ago that we would still be talking about when Libya would next have its elections, when Libya would pass a constitution. These were things that were discussed very, very early on during the period of the National Transitional Council in 2011. And we also have this you know, underlying elephant in the room almost of this question, the larger looming question of when will Libya have its national reconciliation? I think when you culminate all those different things, I think you begin to realize that Libya is still void of the really important institutions that most states have. I think, again, when we look at this in the, in the greater context, we shouldn't wrench Libya from its regional context and that is that other institutions or neighboring countries have very, very formidable, quite deep institutions. In Tunisia, in, uh, in, in Egypt, for example, we do have uh, two militaries, very, very polar, you know, or very, very uh, different uh, militaries in their, in their role in the states. I think you look at Tunisia and you see a, a neutral military one that is subservient to the states. And then when you look to the east of Libya, you find that it's ultimately the military that commands and controls the presidency and the state. And it's these kind of two different maps, really, and these two different directions that when you look at the wider region, when you look at the way in which countries have come into Libya, beyond just the, the surface level of, you know, the economic scramble and the, you know, at, at times some of the aspects of the, of the logistical uh, uh, or rather Libya's geography and where it stands within the larger Mediterranean and, and, and NATO southern flank, and that's certainly drawn in Russia. But when we think of what Stephen was saying about, uh, truly about Ankara, Cairo, 
and Abu Dhabi and their role in the conflict. I think there are certain aspects there that go beyond the economy. There are ideational aspects here about why these countries have been drawn to Libya. And I think this is really where I have, you know, over the last several years been thinking about how to define Libya's conflict. And I think it is, it's a conflict or there are essentially two irreconcilable visions of the state. And that's still really the, 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 the vacuum that has been left behind by Gaddafi has left this kind of question that is looming. And these two irreconcilable uh, visions of the state are essentially that there is one fairly forward progressive looking vision of the state, a civilian led state, where the military is subservient and neutral, um, irrespective of the political tone of the presidency, um, in the way that, for example, Tunis is. And then when you look to the east of Libya in Cairo's shadow, you find that there is an, an, an ulterior uh, uh, vision of the state. You find that this state is really one where the command and the control of the state and the political character of the state is defined by its relationship to the presidency, where the, where the, the presidency is ultimately a tool of the military, that there is no separation of power, so to speak. And I think that's also when we look at the, the context of Libya's unification process, the UN process, the Berlin process that has endured over the last 18 months, that is also the, the major question. Why has Libya been in conflict for the last several years? I mean, the, the rejection of the government of national accord that the speakers referred to, its dysfunction, as it's labeled inside the Berlin communique, its dysfunction emanates from its rejection as the Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, the, the Presidential Council of the GNA, its rejection and its dysfunction emanates from Khalifa Haftar and Hagel Salah, the two, either the architect and the commander of the Libyan Arab Armed Forces, the Libyan National Army. It's their rejection of a, of a presidency that is out of their control. And I think that question is still looming, especially when we start to look towards the next 12 months. I mean, yes, there has been a process that has culminated and was successful in, in Geneva over the last several weeks. We do have a presidency in Mohammed al Manafi. We have a prime minister in Abdul Hamid Beba. These are two outsiders that relate their relationships and their and their and, and their ideological tone or or even their, their political direction is still unknown. And I still think there is so much up for grabs, not only over the next 12 months, but over the coming over the coming years, really, in Libya's transition. I think it's too short term to suggest that you know things will go back to bed in the next 12 months, as Deborah has mentioned about elections. The, the vacuum that was left behind, the institutional vacuum that was left behind a decade ago is still up for grabs. And I think that's also one of the reasons why it has drawn in Turkey and the UAE. I mean, if we look at both of those countries today in the second track, the military track, both are engaged in radically different visions and radically different operations in Libya. One on the, on the, on the western side of Libya, the Turkish attempt to essentially try to uh, uh, immunize Libya's military from these tribal city states kind of uh, uh, small pockets of of control local neighborhood controls that we find within the military or the rather the militias really in western libya and then on the eastern side we find that they're deeply infused with the same tribal patronage structure that was left behind by the jamahiriya that is being reconstructed by khalifa haftar and his allies in cairo and, uh, and, and abu dhabi so i think these two competing visions of the state they're two competing irreconcilable structures of the military and their relationship to the presidency, then these are all questions that are left up for grabs. And I think those questions will ultimately leave us with one final question, which is the same as we left it a decade ago. What is going to be the political character of Libya's state? Will it be a civilian state where the military is subservient? Or will it be like to the east of Libya? Will it be really a, 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 a state that is controlled by its military? So I'll leave it there, but I'm, I'm, I'm really glad and delighted with the, the previous uh, uh, distinguished guests and, and their comments. Okay, now we have a couple of some very interesting questions. The first one is for Ambassador Ambassador, Ambassador Jones, but, but but I think he can be interested in all the other the other uh, speakers as well. Is the following: Has the United the, the UAE substantively changed its views, policies, or actions involvement in regarding Libya in the last six months? What concrete tools does the Biden administration have to influence Emirati involvement in Libya? Are the Emirati opposed to Libyan elections in the near term? Deborah, do you want to start tackling this question first, and then uh, we'll see if Roberto and uh, Steve uh, have something, something to say about this. Sure. Um, I can only, I'm, you know, I'm not privy to Emirati thinking right now on this. Uh, what I do know is from past experience that, again, and this gets back to Anas's comment on the idea, ideational conflict. Um, the Emiratis gave a lot of uh, lip service to the UN process. 
and have always said, you know, we support, they would sign things publicly. But for those of you familiar with, um, with a classical literature, it reminded me always somewhat of uh, Penelope uh, weaving by day to keep the suitors away and then unraveling under the cover of darkness by night um, to ensure that the situation would continue. <clears throat> I think <clears throat> one thing that we do know is that there is a, a, a sort of a, a modern version, an ideological version of our own uh, Cold War with the Soviet Union before. Only this time it is between Turkey and Qatar and uh, those states who do believe that you can have uh, a demo democratic Islamic, uh, you know, or Islam oriented or uh, governments and those who believe that you cannot, that you need authoritarian regimes, that the region's not ready for that. And Libya presents this very curious case because, of course, you had a dictator, but on the other hand, Gaddafi did a tremendous job of persuading Libyan people that they were actually part of this big, uh, you know, Jahia, that they all could speak to each other and have their councils. And so every Libyan, as we've seen in all of these processes leading up to the latest agreement, have always felt and believed that they had a voice, they needed to have a voice, they were entitled to have a voice. So it's a conundrum for people. I don't know that um, I would like to think that the UAE is serious when it says it's going to engage. Uh, I had, you know, we I know them very well. I, I mean, I admire many things about them, but I've been telling them since 2014 that Halifa Hefter was a disaster and incompetent. And yet they saw him as their only tool to uh, avert having an Islamist or a Muslim Brotherhood government come in and take over a country that had huge uh, financial reserves because of its energy. Um, I note when I, you know, Steve, as to yours, we're going to disagree on a number of things. First, just because Turkey is not Lebanon, it's huge, it's a NATO ally. And we've always had a fractious relationship. You know, when I was there, the Turks were whining about uh, the situations in northern Iraq. We were whining about the fact that Erdogan wasn't autocratic enough in directing parliament to let groups through. These, this goes on and on. It's like a bad marriage in many ways, but it still remains an important relationship and it is a NATO relationship. And I think that, that it is going to be key working at our problems with Turkey, um, which you know are many and no one's denying that is going to be critical to dealing with other issues in the area, including in Libya, where I do think Turkey has some historic ties and economic ties as well, but historic ties that, that they would say justifies their overt participation. And I think that's an important thing to note, that Turkey has always been overt about what it's doing everywhere because it, it finds a way to justify that to its parliament. But getting back to the issue of pressure on, you know, has the UAE changed its stripes? I, I personally think that Egypt is back, coming back into Tripoli with a mission because they realize uh, that, that, that this now, uh, the, the, conf, the conflictual side has not worked. Uh, they need to be back in there and have influence in some way or another with a government that is uh, going to, is recognized, going to be recognized again internationally. And I am one of those who challenged absolutely the bluff made on behalf of Egypt by the UAE, I'm sorry, that they would go into CERT. You know, Sisi has his own problems at home and, and he doesn't need to be manipulated by someone else. The UAE, I notice, is also um, shutting down its base in Eritrea. They've had issues in, in Somalia, as, as we all know, and they have issues in Yemen right now. Uh, the, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has its own challenges right now and has reached out you know, has had a relationship with Turkey and other places. I think, again, we're going to see more pragmatism than some people might think. And I think that it, it, the U.S. is going to have to play an important role in helping at least to um, engage with others and, and, and create fora or, or situations for people to talk it out honestly. I do think that Libya is going to have to focus on transparency in its organizations and some way of controls to reassure uh, the UAE and others that that it is not going to be engaged in some great ideological battle or funding groups that are uh, committed to the uh, the destruction of you know of, of governance in the Gulf as it says these are existential issues for everybody um, the UAE sees that as an existential issue for them for their survival as a country 
And so they are going to be very aggressive in how they deal with that. And, and no one can challenge that. And in fact, I think they've actually taken a number of lessons from uh, the, UA, the USA and other allies in terms of what we would always say, this is our advanced defensive you know, yeah. the, uh, the, uh, positions on things. So they may be overextended now. They may find themselves overextended. They may find other tools that they're using that are very difficult for Libya. Libya's biggest challenge is that there are so many ways to unravel uh, through social media, through you know cyber warfare, all the things that we have just dealt with in the United States in our election, no matter how mature our organizations are, our institutions and how devoted we are to democracy. So this is a huge challenge. Um, will the US uh, you know, sanction the UAE? I don't see that that will come. Uh, look, the UAE is an important partner for us. This is the dilemma of modern day, as I said earlier. These regional relationships are as important as some of our alliances, perhaps even more so right now. And so the US is in this difficult position of having a fractious and troublesome NATO ally who is really causing a lot of headaches and creating a lot of unhappiness on the Hill, um, engaged in a, in a situation with a Gulf ally, a Gulf partner, um, that uh, who also engages, you know, as we've seen from the latest uh, communications with Rohana and and and, and uh, Yusuf Alateba, who engages in behaviors we don't like either. But what we're finding, as I said again, is that we no longer hold the stick that can make everyone jump uh, when we say jump and and ask us how high. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, any comment from uh, from the the other the, the, the other speaker, Stephen and us. Just um, one, I, I think the Emiratis, again, I think that they're going to slowly back away from, uh, from Libya, um, especially with a kind of change in Egyptian strategy. And again, as I said, the incompetence of Khalif Haftar. Uh, on the other point that Deborah made with regard to US and Turkey, I think we're just going to have to, uh, I think we're just going to have to agree to disagree on this. But I don't think that anybody has ever made the point that the relationship between Turkey and the United States was not fractious, nor did anybody ever say that the relationship wasn't important. I think the point was that these countries see the world in different ways and are moving in different ways. And the, the idea that we are going to, through enough diplomacy, convince the Turks of the righteousness of our cause or vice versa, I think is very, very low. We have other, uh, some other questions. One is talking about speaking of leading from behind, as, as you described so well. Should the US appoint a special envoy for Libya as a one-stop shop, one phone call away from to coordinate not only with friends and allies, but also within the administration? Who, who wants to tackle this, this, this question? Yeah, I think that's coming from Jim LaRocco or someone. Um, you know, look, I don't have uh, the names, per, so. perhaps in lieu of an ambassador at this stage, since we don't have someone present uh, in physically in Libya right now, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, if you call a tomato by another name, is it still a rose or a tomato <laughs> or a rose is a rose is a rose, whatever. We do need a point person who is able to travel, who can engage uh, with uh, the Libyans. I think it all depends on how you define the role. Um, is it someone who's going to engage with, with whom? With the government there, then it's an ambassador. Um, an empowered ambassador uh, who would be traveling all over. I, you know, normally we don't have a special envoy when it's a, a one uh, a bilateral relationship. But in this case, I think given the international nature of, of Libya's situation and this great game that we're talking about, we probably do need two people. We need a special envoy who is interacting with the governments, the other governments that are involved and has access uh, at least to a senior position in the NSC or, you know, to the, has the presidency or somehow, um, as well as at the State Department or the Secretary of States. Um, but I think that, uh, uh, you know, probably makes a lot of sense in this case, that you need to have coordination on both the international levels and at the bilateral institution building level within Libya, because Libya needs attention uh, for itself as well. That's probably the, the the way the Italians went with uh, appointing our know, special envoy for the international part and and uh, in combined combination with the, with an ambassador in Tripoli. That's that's I think uh, it's, it's how they went. 
And there's another question for all the panelists. What can Libyan civil society and international humanitarian and human rights organizations do to support ending the Libyan quagmire? Who, who, wants, to, who wants to tackle this? Anas, do you want to answer this question? Sure, I think it's a it's a really difficult question because I am I am torn on this question. I think, you know, it's it's um, it's difficult. I think you know, as as Deborah mentioned very very early on in her opening statement about you know the sheer level of fatigue that Libyans you know uh, should endure perhaps until they get to this kind of mutually hurting stalemate. Um, but I was often you know I often spoke with Libyan friends about this when the commentary was taking place in the early parts of 2019 during the conflict when, when you know, journalists arrived to, to Libya and were asking Libyans how they felt about the war. And they said, we're the spectators. You know, so I think in some respects, you know, it's, it's, a, it's baffling to see how over a decade, despite the mushrooming of civil society, the number of human rights groups there, the number of activists there, and the serious engagement with you know, not only just the paraphernalia of democracy, but the democratic culture that has taken root across most parts of Libya. That still, you know, they found themselves as being spectators when it comes to the the larger the larger point about what they can do to really kind of wrestle and and bring back this, um, you know, bring back the transition of the sorry, bring back the the revolution really back to its course. And I think there are there are many ways in which to do that. I think I would go back to your your previous question. I think in terms of sending in a special envoy, I think you know the most important aspect here is really thinking about where Libya's transition is going, political, economic, and military. Libya really needs a diplomatic track. I mean, you know, we look at the two vehicles that we think of today that are supposed to solve Libya's chaos and dilemma, the, but the very same vehicle really that brought this to the fore, the UN Security Council. You know, when it, when it, when it passed UN uh, Security Council Resolution 1973 in March 2011 to protect civilians, you know, we go back to the comments of Hassan Salama, you know, the, the, the 10, first 10 days of the conflict, he spoke to NPR and said, Libyans need to understand the UN is no longer in that same configuration. So, you know, I think Libyans are also seeing here how much they can do. I don't think Libyans can pressure the 20,000 mercenaries, you know, that the Turks, that the Egyptians, sorry, that the Emiratis, you know, and the Russians have delivered to Libya. They can't pressure them out of Libya. You know, they can't pressure. I think one of the main things, and I, I don't want to go on too long with these comments. One of the main things that a special envoy, especially from the US could do, is to send the right signals to inoculate Libya from the very acts that ripen either Libyans at the local intercommunal level or at the national level to conflict. And I think the two, the first two things is to send the right messages to either, you know, adversarial, to their adversaries or to their partners, and to explain that they need to stop violating the arms embargo. It's a very, very simple aspects. I don't know whether or not those conversations will take place, but to stop violating the arms embargo, you know, and, to, and that has to be the first key message that is said. I think in the latter stages, when Libyans are able to kind of play that role, it's when Libya is inoculated from the kind of violence that has destabilized and, and you know, overthrown its, its revolution. I think that's when they can play a, state, a, a role, but at a much more mature stage, they can't do this alone. And I remember the voices that told us in 2011, don't worry, we can do this alone. That was, that was naivety of the worst kind. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Any, anyone else? We can go for the next question, which is a very delicate one. Okay. It says, what are France's objectives? Prompting support for Khalifa Haftar and has tangible progress been made towards their achievement? Can anything be done to reconcile France's conflicting interest with Italy and the UN EU? What do you think, Roberto? Do, do, would you like to pick up this question? Well, it, it's not easy. I think, frankly, that the best chance we have, the best bet we can make in terms of at least France and Italy to come together to some kind of agreement and uh, to at least share some of the objectives on the ground is to actually have a, a broader framework. I don't really see the EU as such taking the initiative, uh, so I don't think we should expect, uh, even given the bright spots that everybody here has tried to um, you know, look at. Um, I don't see Italy and France all of a sudden coming together with a big plan for Libya and convincing the other Europeans that, that that's a priority. What could happen otherwise is uh, a different sequence of events. Uh, if uh, the facts on the ground uh, make it somewhat easier to start a process that we've been trying to, uh, in a way, figure out, at least in its early stages, including 
perhaps an American special envoy, including perhaps um, a more uh, active role by, uh, by the UN itself in conjunction with possibly uh, some of the NGOs on the ground and so on. Well, at that point, there will be an incentive for the EU to contribute uh, to the process. Uh, <coughs> then I see it as, as, a, as plausible, at least, that Italy and France could uh, uh, you know, come to the realization that they're not really uh, achieving their national objectives, simply because it's impossible on a purely national basis. Uh, no one is actually benefiting from this uh, split. Um, so I'm, I'm not very optimistic in terms of, again, taking the initiative uh, from either Rome, Paris or Brussels. But yes, the EU would probably participate. Uh, and Germany is also, of course, because of the Berlin process and all that. I mean, Germany is not to be underestimated as, as the other important actor in, in, a, in a European context. Um, in a wider format, in a wider context, I think uh, we could uh, see even the, the, the French-Italian problem uh, diluted, if not completely resolved. Can you all just come in very quickly on that point? I think yes. it's, um, yes. it's, it's, a, it's a super interesting question. I think, you know, we have a, we have a piece on this written by Jihad Guillaume um, for, for, the, for the great game, for the, his chapter on France. You know, and France, we have to remember, has been drawn to Libya for a variety of reasons. You know, it's 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 always been there. You know, if we go back to 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 De Gaulle, who insisted, you know, uh, uh, during their time in the uh, in, in 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 Algeria, um, that you know that they need to have a foothold in uh, uh, in Libya, in Fezzan, in the south of Libya, not only because of, of countering their opponents uh, during the, the Second World War, but also you know to ensure that they had access to Libya's great expanse, its desert, its geostrategic location towards the Sahel and Sahara, and I think that. Has always been a case. I think when we go to 2011, Sarkozy's own motivations for being drawn into to Libya vary. I think there, you know, there is a great debate happening within, you know, within circles in Paris now to suggest whether or not uh, uh, Sarkozy was brought in because of his now uh, the allegation that he was he was funded by Gaddafi. I think that's one perspective. It's not necessarily one that I agree upon. I think they thought this was an easy win, like many international powers at the time. But it has been drawn back to Libya for a variety of reasons, and most notably by its alliances through, you know, uh, Egypt, the UAE, and latterly by Russia. I think, you know, France is the great, the most complex of all of the actors. It's as as Roberto has mentioned earlier on. It's, it's rivalry with Italy. Its competitiveness, I would say, with Italy is one aspect and dimension of its role in Libya. Trying to have primacy as a main European power, as the UK sort of, you know, went back to the periphery following its role in 2011. It's been really the Italians and French that have been jostling over control. But when we think of its, its aspects on the ground since 2014, it's, it's alliance building with, with the UAE and with, uh, and with Egypt working on the ground in Benghazi throughout 2015 and 16. I think there were ideational aspects that drew them there. There was a period that France went through a very traumatic period with, with attacks uh, at the Bataclan in, in Paris 2015 and, and the ISIS attacks, you know, that really drew their attention and, and the need for them to fight at an ideational level and at an organizational level, the ideas behind ISIS. And in France's position, those, those ideas, if we look at the, you know, the debate that is happening today, the presidential debate that is happening today, this week, a bit of a minister in, in Macron's administration arguing with, with, uh, with, with, uh, with Marie Le Pen, you know, and, and Marie Le Pen's eyes and, and I, you know, her eyebrows kind of going up and saying, what do you mean there is a problem with Islam? And what do you mean I'm not tough enough about that? There is, a, there is something there, it's a deeply uncomfortable conversation to have, but there is an aspect there where there is a fear of Islamists in the same kind of ideational definition as the as the as the uh, the UAE. This isn't just the Muslim Brotherhood. They believe that this is a problem with the religion. They believe this is a problem with people of religion of the region voicing their political concerns, and that has drawn them to you know the UAE and Egypt's project in eastern Libya. And I think today, when we go to 2019, their backing of Khalifa Haftar, its failure has left them at a crossroads. They don't know which way to go. They try to work with. Fatih Bashara, the, 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 who was going for prime ministership in the last round of the UN, uh, UN uh, LPDF, it failed. They've continued to work with Khalifa Haftar despite his failure. It's, you know, it's really kind of a muddle, but I would say that France's complexity is even more complex now than it was even three or four years ago. Thank you, Anas. Now we're, we're reaching the end of the time allocated for us. But, but, but uh, having you, you guys have talked about a lot, of, a lot of things and gave, gave a, 
very very detailed and, and, and refined at the same time vision of all these these international issues and how they relate in various actors and how they relate internally now let me ask you with the, to conclude with a general question it tries to bring everything together with 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 the domestic issue what are the chances of success for the incoming presidential council and prime minister Will they get Libya to the 24 December 2021 elections milestone? So from, 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 from Deborah and then continue to, 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 to the others. Deborah. Hey, thank you, um, Karim. Boy, I wish I had a crystal ball, but I will say something that I think is actually important uh, right now and that I do feel hopeful about if we can provide, again, a safe space for Libyans themselves to work this out. And this is going to sound curious, but it, in a way it ties into what was just previously discussed about France and Italy and their relationships with the previous regime and etc. I think one of the most important things is to for Libya to overcome uh, this, you know, political exclusion that they had of former technocrats and people who had worked yeah. before. Libya has got to be for all Libyans, and we have said that again and again and again. And I think that Dveba and these guys have ties that cross these uh, boundaries and in, in a way uh, give them uh, an opportunity if they will take it and if others will also accept that opportunity to reach out again uh, in, in some sort of national reconciliation that brings in you know, former technocrats, uh, the former foreign minister, for example, people who are actually committed to Libya, have a knowledge of governance, had ties to the previous regime. Um, I've often been one, and this is going to sound, you know, outrageous to some people, but I've often said, you know, Saif al-Islam played a very uh, particular role at one point. Um, whether Libya needs to have some kind of reconciliation hearing, I don't know what, but the fact is the country is is so fluid, transactional, and opportunistic that the only way we're going to get it back, you know, to re, as some have made the joke about Humpty Dumpty's egg, but I don't think it's that bad. I think if we can create a safe space for Libyans of all ilk to come together again and talk about what matters to their country, what's important for them, and building a safe place for them so that they can manage, uh, close that vacuum that is inviting in all this external interference. That, that it, amazes me, it, 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 it amazes me that, 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 that we are still talking 10 years after uh, see, the same argument we had, at the, I remember at the beginning of the, of the revolution, the, the, the necessity for a national reconciliation moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the, and get the, rid the, of that. The, the, that's true, 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 true. Yeah. That preceded even the elections. Yep. I, that's my position. Thanks. Me too. Thank you, uh, Roberto. No, just if one. You, if, if, if you want to conclude on, on, on this, or, 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 or address whatever whatever point you think is it's important. Oh, just for one, you. one word, which is a general thought, in fact, uh, that I failed to mention earlier, although I alluded to it when I when I uh, mentioned the importance of Libya, the objective importance of Libya for so many other countries. I mean, Libya is Libya is potentially a very rich country. We shouldn't forget that. Uh, because of the size of the population, you know, the size the of... The truth is that if they continue this way, if the elite continues this way, there will, there will, there will, there will, will, will not be much left. If, no, if, no, if we continue to, to go this way, so that we will find us back, absolutely. back to the 1940s. It's a, it's a huge waste of, of, of human uh, resources as well as, as other resources. But still, I think the foundations for a rich country are still there. Uh, and that's, it's amazing that we keep forgetting this, which means to me, uh, as an outside observer, is that Libya uh, as a country, if only that process could start, uh, a process of ownership to some extent as well, yeah. uh, could actually accommodate um, the, the influence of other countries and relationships with many other countries. I mean, to me, it's a bit ridiculous to think of uh, France and Italy competing for, uh, for energy resources that are basically, uh, I mean, not endless, but very, very vast. You know, and of course, the future doesn't have to be based on, on oil and gas only, as we all know. So the future can could well bring something else. But uh, it's a bit absurd to think in those terms. Although, uh, let me just add one point. I very much agree with uh, what Anas was was arguing earlier that, of course, yes, uh, France's reasoning uh, is always very much to do with the, the Sahel. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the way they, and I think correctly, 
uh, look at, at, at the whole uh, Libyan situation. Absolutely, yes. It would be impossible to understand what they're doing without taking that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto. Steve? Thanks, Kareem. Let me just uh, end because we are, time is growing short. Uh, let me just, and I will defer um, to the expertise of you, Anas, Roberto, and Deborah on the question of domestic politics in Libya and whether uh, things are going to work out. Um, I certainly am of the view that I think the if it was up to Libyans, <laughs> things would work out, but it's unfortunately not. Um, but I do want to end on this question because I think it's directly related in ways to this where I started, which is North Africa is actually important. And this question about appointing a U.S. ambassador or an envoy. Now, that's a very kind of inside baseball process oriented thing that I think a lot of people in Washington get back bogged down on. And the question is, well, why should we appoint one a, a special envoy or an ambassador, which is really basically the same thing, but we call it something else. Um, and to say that, well, stability, th th that's not really a good enough reason to do it, but there is a good reason to do it. And I think it's going to annoy people when I say this, but it really has not as much to do with Libyans. Like I said, I'm fairly confident that Libyans kind of know what they want at this point. But we should appoint a special envoy or an ambassador to Libya to help this process because we're most interested in Europe and because of Libya's proximity to Europe and because Libya is rending Europe apart, one of those issues that is rending Europe apart. And because the stability of Europe as whole, free and prosperous and all those other things is a core national interest of the United States. And because North Africa is basically either the front yard or the backyard, depending on <laughs> kind of the form of argument here, of, of Europe, it's important to the United States. And it's important for Libya to no longer be uh, a source of instability on either the front or backyard uh, of Europe. And that's why I think it's important. The question that I really have is, does the Biden administration really have the bandwidth for this, given the multiplicity of domestic issues it has on its plate and the big issues related to the JCPOA and, and, and others. I, if, if someone were to ask me, I would say that this should be an issue because we're concerned about, we're concerned about Europe uh, itself. That's, that, that, that's definitely a good, uh, a good anyway, point. A good we have two minutes left. It's another, it's yeah. another. Thank, thank you. The, the two minutes left, to, I'd like to give them to Anas to, to, to conclude. Thank you so much, Kareem. Thank you to the other guests for their exceptional comments and insights. I think I'll leave it at this. I mean, you know, one of the things and the fears that I had when, when we kind of set off on this journey of this project was that we would be talking about states and forgetting that, you know, that his, the Libya's history of the last decade is also about its people. And I think the comments that have just taken, uh, have just been mentioned now, you know, are also reminding me that this is about Libya's journey. And I think, you know, when we leave that in mind, Libyans have the potential to, to reconcile. I certainly know it from experience. And, and I certainly know that many of the people that I, I saw only recently in the last several months when speaking to, to family and friends back in Tripoli have that aspiration. But I think a deeper commitment from the West, and I think also Stephen's comments, much more insightful than my own, is one way to achieve it. But I think we need to think of this now before the dilemma gets to 20 years and the situation is much worse. There's so much that could be done and there's so many ways in which we could do it while it's still fairly simple. So I'll leave it there. But again, thank you so much to, to yourself, Karim, and to the Atlantic okay. Council for hosting us. And, and it's been a real delight and a pleasure this afternoon. Thank you, Anas, for sharing with us your report. Thank you very much, Deborah, Stephen, and Roberto. You have been great. I hope that everybody enjoyed as much as I did. And uh, thank, thank you also to, 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 to all those that attendees who have had the patience to listen to us and, and, and get the, the food of thought that they have been given today. Thank you very much also for to, uh, to the program assistant at the at the Rafika Lili Center, uh, Alisa Padilla, to, uh, to, 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 to all, all the communications team and the events team at the, the Atlantic Council. Thank you, thank you very much all, and hope to see you soon in, to, 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 to another one of our events coming soon. Thanks. <laughs>